Do you want to know a secret? The voice almost made me jump. I glanced up from the book I was reading to find an old man sat opposite me. I was on the train home from uni at the time and I'd been reading for most of the journey. I didn't even hear him sit down. The first thing I noticed about the man was his age. When I say the guy was old, I mean old. The poor bugger looked like he was on his last legs. The lines on his face were so deep they could have been carved. His watery blue eyes stared out from wrinkled pits. There were heavy, purple bags under those eyes that looked like bruises, as if the guy hadn't slept in years. The second thing I noticed about him was the object balanced on his lap. A large, black box scoffed around the edges. I'm not going to say the box looked older than he did, but the thing had clearly seen better days. The man stared at me without blinking, and it took me a moment to remember he'd asked the question. Sorry? I asked if you want to know a secret. So I had heard him right. I glanced from the box to his blue eyes, my mind making a fast calculation about him. Was the guy unhinged, or simply a lonely man looking to make small talk? There was no discernible expression on his face, but there was definitely something in his eyes I couldn't quite place. Not a sadness, exactly, but something similar to that. No, the guy was probably just lonely, and how dangerous could someone his age really be anyway? What sort of secret is it? I smiled across at him, but he didn't smile back. The secret to never growing old. Never growing old? That's right. I had to suppress a grin. If the man sitting in front of me knew the secret to never aging, he obviously hadn't quite perfected it yet. His gnarled hands, which were clutched around the box in the way a mother might cradle a baby, shook as I watched him. Okay, try me, I said. What's the secret to never growing old? The man stared at me for a moment without saying anything anything. Outside the train window, trees and fields blurred by. The man opened his mouth, licked his lips, then closed it again. His watery eyes didn't blink. I caught another glimpse of the same thing I'd seen before in those eyes. That half sadness. But a second later, it was gone again. The thing is, said the man. I can't really tell you what the secret is. He cleared his throat. I have to show it to you. His eyes flicked down to the box in his lap. The gnarled hands shifted. I keep it in here. Now, at this moment, I had two choices. I could politely excuse myself, or I could continue to indulge what I was rapidly suspecting might be more than just lonely small talk. The man was obviously a bit deluded. He still hadn't smiled, and he was staring at me with an intensity that made me uncomfortable. The whole way through school, we'd been warned about talking to strangers. Not to get too close to them, certainly not to take anything from them, just to walk away. But I wasn't at school anymore, was I? I was a university student now, an adult. And the man in front of me was so decrepit, he couldn't possibly pose a threat. All of these thoughts flew through my head in the space of a couple of seconds. I think what decided it in the end, though, what made me choose to indulge him a little longer, was simple curiosity. I wanted to see 
inside the box. Even if it turned out to be something completely ridiculous. I wanted to find out what the guy had in there regardless. At the very least, it might make for an amusing story. I smiled at him and stood up from my seat, moved across and sat down beside him. So, I said, where did you stumble across the secret to never aging anyway? An old man showed it me, he muttered, almost to himself. Then his eyes flicked from me down to the box. His fingers shifted and slid across its surface, found the lid. They shook worse than ever. A moment before the man opened it, he whispered something to me I'll never forget. I'm so sorry, he said. But we're lucky in a way, the two of us. His fingers pried open the box's lid. I leaned forward and looked inside. And I fell into the void. I don't really know how to describe what I saw and experienced in the endless window of time that followed. I thought about it a lot, replayed it over and over again in my mind, dreamed about it, but it's very hard to articulate. I'll do my best. The first thing was the sight my eyes registered when I looked into the box. Darkness. The inside of the thing was utterly pitch black, like staring into the mouth of a very deep cave. A total absence of anything. The darkness seemed to shift and expand as I stared into it, reaching out from the box and spilling into my peripheral vision. The next thing I remember was a falling sensation. Have you ever been skydiving? or ridden on a really steep roller coaster, there's a feeling of hollowness you get as you drop, when your stomach seems to push its way up into your throat. A sick, dizzying rush. That was the feeling I had in that moment, and it was stronger than anything like I'd ever felt before in my life. It was as though the blackness in that box was alive, and as I leaned over, it rushed out and swallowed me whole. One minute, I was sat in the train beside the old man. The next, I was free falling through an abyss. There was no sound whatsoever in that void. The background noise of the train, the rush of the carriage on its rails, the faint mutter of other passengers, vanished as if the volume had been muted. But the darkness wasn't entirely empty. As I plummeted through infinite blackness, my eyes picked out tiny pinpricks of distant light, smaller than grains of sand. Most were impossibly faint, but a few were bright enough to stand out in the dark. I think they may have been stars. I don't know how long I fell for, Time no longer seemed to register. I could have spent seconds in that empty space. It could have been years. All I know is that it all ended when I saw another shape come tumbling towards me. The shape was distant at first, just another pinprick of light. But as I fell towards it, it gradually became more and more distinct. At some point, I realized it was another person. I picked up four limbs flailing through the dark, a light dusting of grey hair, and finally, as a person hurtled towards me through the yawning black sea, I saw two wide blue eyes. A second before I crashed into the old man, the universe vanished. I opened my eyes and saw the train. Blue seats opposite me, faint chatter of other passengers, a station outside the window, slowly rolling by as the train picked up its pace. No sign of the old man anywhere. 
That's okay, I thought to myself. You had a bad dream, that's all. You fell asleep and dreamed the whole thing. But I knew that wasn't right. There was something about my surroundings that was subtly different, which my shell-shocked mind couldn't yet place. My body felt different too, weak and sore, as if I'd just run a marathon. I shifted in my seat and felt something in my lap. I looked down. The black box was there, its lid firmly back on. I drew in a sharp breath. I suddenly felt incredibly lightheaded. It wasn't the sight of the box that did it though. It was my hands. The shaking hands that were clasped around the object in my lap. So tight, the knuckles had turned white. The hands were wrinkled and gnarled at the joints with arthritis. They didn't belong to me. All that happened six months ago. I've been officially missing for the past five months, three weeks and five days. Apparently, I was last seen on CCTV footage exiting the Channel Tunnel in Calais. No one has seen me since. Whoever the person is that's now inside my 18 year old body, they clearly had a plan in place. I've watched the whole thing play out on the news. A university student who decides to run away from home isn't exactly front page stuff, but one who disappears so successfully is. For the first week, it was all the papers seemed to be talking about. The hardest part has been seeing my family on the television, my brother and sister red faced in front of the camera, my dad looking pale, mum crying. Seeing her upset was the worst of all. That first week after it happened, I actually travelled back to my hometown. I followed my mom in Tesco. She was white faced, shuffling around the store like a zombie. A few people came up to her, probably people who recognised her from the TV, to say how sorry they were. She nodded and forced a smile, didn't say anything back. Eventually, I worked up the courage to approach her too. I don't know what I was expecting when she turned to face me. I guess a part of me hoped that, despite how different I look now, she'd have recognised something in me, seen something in my eyes. She didn't though. She just smiled and nodded when I spoke, like she did with the other strangers. All she saw was an old man. I need to act soon. One way or another, I know I need to. The man who stole my life may have been desperate, but he wasn't a complete monster. He left me enough money in the pocket of my blazer he wore to survive, enough to pay for food and hotels, at least for a while, at least while I make my own decision. Because the money wasn't the only thing he left me, was it? He also left me the black box. And ever since I woke back up on the train and found the thing in my lap, I've never let it out of my sight. I carry it with me wherever I go. I hold it in my arms when I shuffle the streets, sleep next to it in my hotel room, and, so far at least, I've kept the lid firmly in place. But I don't know how much longer that can last. The thing is, I'm old, impossibly old. My body feels like a car that's changed owners so many times and driven so many miles that it's only got a few left in the tank. I need to do something before it's too late. In the months after it happened, I told myself I couldn't do it. Not ever. I told myself I could never put another person through the thing that I've been put through. But lately, lately, 
I felt afraid. Afraid I'll fall down some steps and break something. Afraid I'll get ill. Afraid that one day, my exhausted husk of a body will finally just shut down. Afraid I'll be gone. Really, finally gone. Before I even turn 19. So, I've been riding the train. The same line I used to take to and from uni. Back and forth. I carry the box with me, of course. And I watch the other passengers. A couple of weeks ago, I spotted one handsome, if a little nervous looking, young man. Short, brown hair, and friendly face. Must be homesick, because he's travelled home the last two weekends in a row. Reminds me. Of me. I haven't spoken to him yet. I doubt he's even noticed me, to be honest. But. I've been watching him. Watching him. And planning. And one day soon. God help me. I think. I may. Have to introduce myself. At the depth of a small hollow, isolated by hills of dense forest, sits a peculiar 21st century attraction. For decades, its wealthy visitors have stayed beyond the wooden walls, etching their names in its guest book. For the many, it is a place which does not exist. Yet for the few, it promises to bring to life the wildest of dreams. A tagline which borders on the cliché were it not for the fact that it offers exactly that. An isolated retreat where each room has a large picture window looking into an enclosure of majestic beasts. If being watched by several pairs of glowing eyes while you sleep is your cup of tea, then Ardois Leather Lodge might be the place for you. Don't be too hasty though. If you're an average Joe of this earth, then it is highly unlikely that you will ever get a peek. It is the elite's best kept secret, you see. Only whispered to those recommended by their predecessors. A wealthy circle of homo sapiens, all sharing the ultimate exclusive experience. The Dorchester Hotel, you say? A mere starter. Mandarin Oriental. A fancy dessert. Ardua Leather Lodge is a complete and utter feast. It is, by all means, a turn of true misfortune that the invitation came into my possession one Friday evening. If you ask any member of the rich and famous, I am a well-respected hotel critic. If you ask any of my closest friends or family, you won't get an answer. I was only considered good at my job because I was born critical. Sure, I may have made a living, but in reality... I am a lonely individual who has yet to form any meaningful relationships. Does it bother me? Of course it doesn't. Is this living? Of course it isn't. Yet by the time I realised this, it was too late. So now I mull over my younger years while slowly rotting away in retirement. Criticism is not an art form. It is the bane of seeing things through tinted spectacles. Unfortunately, those things include other human beings. The letter itself was oddly simplistic. It was posted through my front door around 10 o'clock that evening in an ebony envelope with gold lettering. No courtesy of a phone number, no address, just the following message. Dear Mr. Labatt, we are delighted to inform you that you are booked in for a weekend stay at Ardois Lodge Hotel and reserve upon recommendation from chairman and live member Mr. Slyne Bevick. Please make your way to Frickett Road, Narcliffe, B50 4PD on the 21st of November at 2.30am where our chauffeur will be waiting. We look forward to having you. The Ardois Lodge Hotel and Reserve Team
I caught a glance of my ghostly self grimacing in the dining room mirror. The bags under my eyes, a painful reminder of my old age. It was for this very reason, in fact, that the letter made me uncomfortable. My retirement was a personal decision, not due to a lack of work. I had become a great admirer of Slime Peter Bevick throughout my career, working with a variety of his hotels. The Hungarian prodigal son was a man of many trades, establishing his own chain at the ripe age of 23 and going on to build a small monopoly within the hospitality industry. I first came across his work back in London when I took on one of his Soho wine and dine experiences, which provided some of the finest steak I have ever had the pleasure of tasting. Though, what I liked most about Bevic was his distinction from the rest of the hotel tycoon crowd. Instead of using money to try and make me talk well of his business, he let his business do the talking. And could they talk? Whether it be his retreat within the depths of the Miombo woodlands, the private gothic getaway of Tallinn, or the renovated war bunkers of Vienna, Bevic and his designers blew the brains of many, my own included. It came as a great shock that Bevit had died in his sleep that night. I'd received a call from a former agent the following morning about news of a severe stroke. For professional reasons, I would not attend his funeral, despite every fibre of my body urging me to go to the crematorium. The invitation to the lodge festered in the back of my mind like a bad memory, the idea growing stronger and stronger as the month of November loomed. The reason I shuffled out of a cab at 2.30am on the 21st was largely down to my sheer respect for the man. I decided to see it as an honour to carry out a review of his last hotel, his last piece of art. Who knew, perhaps even his magnum opus. The winter air had a sharp bite as the headlights of my taxi lit up a figure in the bleak beyond. My ears were met with an eerie creaking sound which echoed from a barricaded gate in front of me. The entrance to an enclosure impossible to gauge the size of. My host, whose figure had slowly morphed into the shape of a large hooded man, proceeded to light up my frozen face with a flashlight before heading straight for the open field. There was a thick fog on the horizon, but I could make out more lights as we approached my next method of transport. The ominous shadows of floodlights began to take shape around us, and the picture painted itself. Walking into an empty airstrip, it dawned on me that my journey by land had come to an abrupt end. The blades of an old chopper started slicing the air above us, walking from its slumber like some mechanical beast out of hibernation. While being ushered into the back seat, I caught a glimpse of myself in one of the windshields, the same bearded ghost from a few weeks ago staring back, lanky in stature with barely enough body fat to keep me warm, notably more bewildered than ever. Not a single word was ushered from the moment I left my Greenwich flat until departure. As I stepped away from the earth, for the first time in years, I felt completely powerless. The bulk of my journey took several hours, with the chopper rattling through the wind high above what I thought was the British countryside. However, I could have sworn to decipher some mountainous terrain ocean and plenty of dense forest. It was among the same dark greenery that I first caught sight of it. Tucked away neatly at the bottom of a large hill appeared a group of strange wooden complexes, each accompanied by open panes of overgrown exotic plantation. What would have appeared as somewhat idyllic if the weather were more pleasant seemed bleak in the winter sleet. Approaching a small landing pad, 
I was slowly overwhelmed by an unwelcome sensation of loneliness. Around us were no other vehicles, lights nor people. Some getaway indeed. Two attempts to land later and my need for blankets and a warm fire had now peaked. Engines cut. You could still hear the faint howling of the dying storm outside. I was somewhat at peace for a moment in time. Mere seconds, in fact, before the pilot unleashed chaos by opening the door. Stepping out down the concrete steps, I was handed over from one figure to another, like some shady trade where I was part of the deal. My new acquaintance was a young Asian lady who, after giving me a quick nod, called over to some men by the entrance of the wooden building. While handing my suitcase, they murmured some words to each other in what sounded like either Mandarin or Cantonese. Up close, the building was unremarkable. A large oak structure, barely built into the hillside. There were no windows, just one solitary door. My short companion produced some sort of keycard from a pocket. One quick beep, a sharp click of the lock, and finally, there was silence. My first attempt at small talk fell on deaf ears as we crept down a narrow corridor. I assumed that this was out of respect for those still sleeping. It must have been around five in the morning after all. The long night had left my head extremely heavy, my brain pressing hard against the back of bloodshot eyes. Our route ahead bordered on sleepwalk, right up until I was awoken at the face of a burgundy door. The woman turned towards me and produced a small diary, tattered at the rim, but still held together. I was able to examine her face properly, her muscles completely idle and fixated on the task at hand. At first glance, she looked young, but there was a remarkable tightness to her skin, which was sewn by neat scars from what looked like plastic surgery. The uncomfortable silence brought the scratching sound of my pen against the guest book to life. The woman nodded once more, handed me another keycard, and walked off out of sight. Finally, I was left to my own senses. I stepped forward into the first room of my stay. Panthera Leo I've just checked the time. My watch shows ten past three in the morning. It is from this point onwards that I may begin my review of the lodge. I must warn you that the following retelling of events will not be what you expect. It is also of most importance to note that it won't be submitted out of respect to Steinbevik, nor anyone associated with the establishment. In fact, my final critique will most probably not come across as much of a critique at all. I write this because I feel that I have to. In order to comprehend the goings on here, I write this not for the public eye, but for my own and the little pieces of sanity that I have left. Ardor Lodge, a review, 23rd of November, 2044. A sea of maroon red overflows from the corridor into the dimly lit room before me. Shadows dance across the walls, different shapes morphing into one another. The roaring fire makes one feel instantly welcome. Panthera Leo's modern Manhattan loft-style rooms are once again tinged with Bevic's paintbrush, with a mixture of Victorian-style furniture and extravagant decorations. A grand chandelier complements the fireplace in the centerpiece, which also offers various forms of entertainment, such as a large screen and surround sound stereo system. To the corner is a small kitchen place animated with racks of expensive booze and a fridge stocked with an assortment of various meats. A glorious king-size bed 
takes up most of the space in the other room. With a sparkling clean ensuite bathroom, an electrical shower complementing it nicely. Panthera Leo lives up to its name in that it offers a room oozing with style, attraction and self-confidence. If an animal as majestic and powerful as the lion was a human being, this is the type of habitat it would occupy. The only disappointing element was the lack of actual lions. As a beautiful sunset lit up the sky, a pinkish hue and the light began to fade. So did my hopes of seeing my feline friends. Staring into the abyss of a dark cave in the distance, I realized that it had been nearly 10 years since I had seen one of its majestic inhabitants in the flesh. All I had spotted during the day were a few carcasses dotted around the park amongst the tall trees. Despite this, for anyone wishing to see their first lion since the feline extinction of 2038, I would not let my misfortune deter you. There sure is life beyond that grass. You can feel it. I wish I could say that the clear skies remained for my second night. After spending the good part of the Saturday sipping whiskey and listening to Coltrane, I decided to tick this room off my list and head down to meet the apes. I found the second retreat, Pandroglodytes, to be a lot smaller than Panthera Leo. Yet my fortunes appeared to have changed because once the heavens opened up over the park, I could just about make out the burly figures of my neighbors. As a personal side note, I must mention that the sight of their shifting shadows was not a welcome one. I had always felt uneasy by the intelligence and strength of primates. It was not their ability to tear a man from limb to limb which frightened me, more so their resemblance to man itself. Anything that looks like a human that isn't terrifies me. My thoughts soon drifted though, delighted to see that this room also came prepared with some beautiful meats and plenty more alcohol. The second lodge is decorated in a peculiar beige color, which covers the majority of the walls. Much like Panthera Leo, it contains tributes to the Victorian, with a grand dining table located in the center of the room. It blows my mind as to how they moved any of this furniture out to the middle of nowhere. Yet, if there was someone who knew the right people, it was Bevic. Every room type at the lodge is distinguished by a different colored door. My knights were the lions represented by a valiant red and the apes a dark oak. There is another experience which includes spending an evening surrounded by alligators. Yet with a population of reptiles still in abundance, the authenticity of this one failed to grip me. Needless to say, my evenings behind red and oak were quite the experience. The food was exquisite, the living conditions just right, and the silence unbeatable. To top it all off, I didn't have to speak to a single soul for the entire two nights. Ardor Lodge is a highly recommended establishment, the greatest getaway, one which I would highly recommend if you're looking for the perfect escape. Signed, Parlin Labat. And so forth marks the end of my review of Ardois Leather Lodge. The time of completion was around 2.30 this morning. Since then, I have been staring at the ink-stained sheets of paper before me. It has been five hours since I added my name to the end of the paper. Seeing as we have come this far, I think I now owe it to you to write to you separately, away from this sheet of lies. I wish I could add more to it. I wish I could offer more of an explanation as to why Slein Bevic's latest creation emphasizes his genius. How his extravagant modern Victoria orgy has culminated into an explosion of avant-garde taste and color. How the place is brimming with the bizarre and peculiar and how the idea alone is a winner. Who'd have thought that we would be able to not only see but live alongside animals 
since the fall of their kingdom. It was something I've barely considered because my thoughts have deepened with the dark. I've realized that this is not a five-star hotel. God, this is not a hotel at all. I must tell you the truth before it is too late. All because I decided to take a look beyond the glass. Every hotel is a facade, you see. Every review I have written is rampant with pretense. A hotel is an establishment providing accommodation, meals and other services for travellers and tourists. As long as it does what it says in the tin and looks good, then you're on to a winner. Yet with everything, the deeper you dig, the more earth you uncover and the more you find, the further you stray from the definition of a hotel. It all started with a 3 a.m. shudder. Waking up a suffocated mess, I scrambled to the kitchen to grab a glass of water. I hadn't suffered from sleep paralysis in quite some time. I often found that it tended to happen whenever I slept in a new place, in a room I wasn't familiar with. Washing the sweat off of my face, I soon realized that my room was lit solely by the bluish moonlight from the picture window. A flick of the light switch and my fears were confirmed. A blackout. As I paced slowly around the kitchen counter, my alerted mind soon grew bored of its surroundings. It was during this time that I convinced myself to do some of that digging. Plunging headfirst into the dark corridor, I questioned my decision immediately. The weak light from my phone created the illusion of a narrowing hallway up ahead. I stumbled forward, following the walls with my hands in the hope of reaching the reception hall. Slowly feeling the rough ridges of the wallpaper, my heartbeats made the wall feel like they were pulsating. With no reception in sight, I decided to knock on a white door ahead of me, where a flicker of light danced slowly at the ridge. A nervous knock, followed by another, resulted in no answer. If I was alone in this establishment, I sure felt it. The room itself was full of bizarre decorations, even stranger than in my previous stays. On the desk lay a series of illegible blueprints illuminated by several candles. While examining one of the old torches, I noticed that the wax had been dripping for some time. I stood quietly as a droplet of white wax fell onto the floor, dripping into a large puddle of water at my feet. I would have assumed it was a staff room, were it not for the large bed and picture window to my right, identical to the lodges I had been staying in. I was almost immediately overwhelmed by the strong smell of rotting meat, which brought tears to my bloodshot eyes as they lingered on the bevic painting above the window. Four lifelike faces lined the canvas, each looking more alive than the last. I found Bevic's art to be uncomfortable in daylight, so illuminating it with a weak phone torch did no favours for my increasing heart rate. These ghoulish masks looked pained, their expressions portraying tormented souls, seemingly tortured for centuries. I continued shining my light around the room, searching the beige wallpaper for some sort of light switch. The room was dead silent, right up until I felt it. A stiffening at the neck, a burning sensation which moves slowly into your stomach and clenches tightly in a chokehold of anxiety. The sick senses which start back up into your brain like warning signals, warning you that you might no longer be alone, warning you that someone is watching you. I pointed my flashlight straight at the window. Trees, another empty encampment. But for whom? For what? Lions? Surely not. 
I scanned the borders slowly, the light trembling with my hand. Too small, I thought. Apes? I looked for trees, but this part of the lodge was void of any kind of greenery. A real sandpit. Guiding the light slowly across the park, that's where I saw it. A moving shadow. With the dying light of my phone, I felt my heart explode into demented palpitations. Turning briskly, I grabbed a candle as a source of light, a source of comfort. Slowly approaching the large window, I got as close as I could until I finally saw the horror beyond my own reflection. Men. Human men huddled in a group, facing downwards. Shaking. Not in a cold shiver, but a mad tremble. One which resonates through you when you are in a rage or terrified. My sweaty palms pressed hard against the glass. I could feel myself quiver in the same way. What looked like a group of five or six human beings stood together in the dark, outside, at three o'clock in the morning. The longer I looked, the worse it got. I realized that something was glistening, yet it was not the glistening of sweat, more the glistening of blood. These beings could not be human, for they were living, not without clothes, but without skin, their bare flesh glistening against my light. I ran down the corridor, stumbling for the exit, screaming and crying in terror. The color of flesh flashed through my mind like a sickness. The colored doors and beige walls, the lifelike paintings, the abundance of raw meat. Collapsing to my floor, I slammed the door in my wake. I have since been cowering in the corner with my pen and open book. What started off as a mirror view has become a diary of my erratic thoughts. If you find this, please rescue me. If it's too late, then I beg you to rescue the others by telling the world about what happened tonight. All I can hope for now is some sort of salvation from this lodge, this damn leather lodge. The time is a quarter to four in the morning and something is glistening in the moonlight right outside my window. Please excuse my English. I'm recording this in the airport with very little sleep. My name is Ignati Sokolova, and I have been in JFK airport for 12 hours. I am in the medical bay, and they will not let me leave. I have lived in Chernobyl my entire life. I was born in the Pripyat Hospital on the 12th of June 1986. My father and my mother were workers at the power plant and so this was the job I chose for myself. While my country was recovering from the economic depression, we still took what we could get and we were grateful for the food on our tables. Leaving Russia was a foreign idea, a glamorous luxury that my family could not afford and when my mother died, it became impossible. I began work on my 18th birthday after a few years of hard work, I was promoted to a senior position. It came at a good time, as my father suffered a stroke four months later and could no longer operate the machinery. Eventually, I was called into the office and I was told I would be taking a business trip to New York because my English was the best. My mother had taught me when I was young. My father shook my hand when I told him, he was proud. I pushed back the thought that I did not want to go, that I was worried for his health until I got to the plane and then cried a little with my face to the window so the man next to me would not see. The plane ride was bumpy. People around me looked at ease. 
but it felt like we would be dashed out of the sky, and even though I swallowed a sleeping pill, it took me hours to get to sleep. The rocking of the plane followed me to my dreams, which were fitful and filled with nightmares so real I did not know if I was awake or asleep. Outside the plane, a flash of light came that was so blinding I shielded my eyes, but not before I saw the huge towers of the power plant illuminated, breaking through the clouds. I woke suddenly and realized the plane was on the ground and I was alone. Everyone must have disembarked while I was still sleeping. I grabbed my bags and quickly walked to the exit. I didn't see any air steward and followed the signs to the exit. I must have been asleep for hours because the first person I saw was a man who opened the door for me on the way out of the building. The busy street smelled like gasoline. The cars were packed into a grid. I looked back as the door swung shut behind me. I can't explain it, but I saw in the split second before the door shut that it was full of people. The empty terminal I had walked out of was now packed, thousands rushing to get to their flights. I felt a sharp buzz in my head, and when I put my hand up to my nose, it came away with blood. I am not used to flying. I could not explain it, so I took a taxi to a hotel nearby and booked a room for two nights with my company card. Perhaps I needed to rest. The receptionist scanned the card at the desk and handed it back to me with a sigh. It had been declined. I took cash out of my wallet, counting it carefully, and was lucky. I had enough. That night in the hotel room, I tossed and turned. The nightmares continued lasting a few minutes or a few hours. Always people disfigured and screaming for help. I could not help them, I said. I did not know how. Then, that flash, that blinding light, and I would wake up to blood pouring from my nose. I looked like hell the morning of the meeting. My face was chalky and the dark circles under my eyes were dark and puffy. I felt stifled on the underground railways. The crush of people around me was unbearably hot. The building was empty. I cannot understand this. The address was printed out for me in my itinerary, but when I got to the correct street, the building was boarded up, and a large, opening soon sign was hanging. I sat in the coffee shop opposite. The waitress who poured my coffee glanced over the address and confirmed I was in the right place. When I asked her about the offices, she said it had been a department store for 10 years, then it had been opening soon for another three. When I called my father's number, the dial tone was all I could hear. That night, as I lay in bed, I took out a photograph of my father and my mother. It is my favorite. They are young in this photograph. My mother is pregnant and she is laughing. My father is holding her hand and the power plant is behind them in the mist. I looked closer. My eyes burned as they watered. It almost looked as if the smoke from the towers was moving. No, it was moving. I saw it then, the small motion of my mother's smiling face as it tilted backwards, the fabric of a dress rippling. I sat up, drenched in sweat. The smoke was coming from the tower so heavily now, it surrounded my parents and I saw their expressions change to fear. The photograph flickered, and I could feel my heart pound as slowly their skin began to blister. 
My mother clutched at her stomach. Her mouth stretched into a scream of pain and fear. My father tried to shield her, the skin sloughing off his hands until I could see the muscle and the bone. The flash of light was so bright, I felt like it had burned away my eyes. And I woke up to feet pounding up the hotel steps and drunken laughing coming from the people in the room next door. I did not find the photograph. I searched all night. I spent the rest of it scrubbing the blood from my nose out of the hotel pillow. I had enough money for a taxi halfway to the airport. I took three buses, terrified of falling asleep and missing the right stop. The unfamiliar voice blared over the speaker system so loudly I could barely understand. The airport was hot, crowded, and I queued in silence. I handed my ticket to the air stewardess. The two nights of no sleep left me hardly able to stand. Unfamiliar food felt heavy in my stomach, and I felt softer, weaker. I'd never been more desperate to get to my own bed. The scanner beat loudly, and the woman removed the ticket, holding it up to the light. Sir, is this a practical joke? She asked me loudly. I felt the stares of strangers on the back of my head and looked down. I'd like to go home, I said. I don't even know what Baikal Airlines is. They don't operate at this airport, but I can assure you there are no flights that will be going directly to Chernobyl. I heard a laugh from the group of teenagers behind me. I could hardly speak. I couldn't understand. I asked her why, and she told me to Google Chernobyl with a face that told me she thought I was stupid. Please, I started to argue, but the room began to shimmer around me like a thousand light spots, and I could hear the stewardess's voice become muffled as I felt my shoulder hit the floor. I woke up alone in the medical bay of the airport with a trickle of dried blood running from my nose to my lip. When I searched Chernobyl, the most terrible, awful images are showing up. Of people with their skin falling off, of my hometown overgrown with weeds as if the earth is choking it. When I first saw them, I ran to the bathroom just in time to empty my stomach into the toilet. Is this... Is this a practical joke? I don't understand. This is not my culture. I'm scared, and I want to go home. When I told the medical staff, they said they were concerned for my mental health, and that they might have to keep me in custody. I don't know what that means, but it terrifies me. So I said that I had seizures, and was always disoriented after an episode. It seemed like they believed me at first, but they want to transfer me to a hospital. Please, someone has to know something. I have to get home to my father. He would not be able to live if I cannot put food on the table, and every time I call him, it tells me the number is not in service. I'm scared of my dreams and of this country, and I don't know what is happening. They are telling me my passport is forged, they will not let me leave. My name is Ignati Sokolova. If anyone knows how I can get home, please message me. But you must be quick. I don't know how much time I have before they come back. Okay, so this is pretty awkward to admit, I won't lie, but considering recent events, my life is pretty much over anyway, so I might as well share it to the internet, I guess. As the title alludes to, I did indeed acquire an artificial lover not too long ago. And no, it's not a sex robot, that just sounds disgusting, like I'm out here banging R2-D2 or something. 
nothing could be further from the truth. This whole thing kinda came out of nowhere for me. I never planned on purchasing such an item. Hell, I've never even paid the pawn before. But also, I haven't had a girlfriend in a while either. So, two weeks ago, I got dragged along to this convention by my good buddy Hal. Hal is a big dude, in both the vertical and horizontal department, with shaggy hair and a wiry orange beard. I'll be first to admit that he's a bit strange, but he's always been a good friend. Hal claimed this convention was a gaming expo. It was only after we were walking inside that I realized it was actually an adult entertainment convention. What the hell, Hal? I asked, oogling the flyer of two voluptuous women. You said this was a gaming expo. Hal scratched his neck and shrugged. Well, it kind of is. They have games. He replied with a pensive smile. I shot a glare back. Oh yeah, games like Who's in My Mouth? Hal seemed to shrink a bit as I contemplated Ubering the 45 minute drive back home. Sorry dude, but you never would have come if I told you the truth. He was right, and I shuddered at the unfortunate euphemism in his choice of wording combined with our current location. I complained and moaned a bit more, but still followed Hal inside. The two of us entered, and I basically gave up on convincing him to reconsider. We walked inside, and were immediately met by a cornucopia of provocatively dressed ladies, cheesy faced salesmen, and neckbeards, trying desperately to tuck in their half jobs into their belts. Rows of booths and tents had been set up to display the latest and greatest in personal pleasure devices. There were sections showcasing virtual reality and pleasure capsules designed for couples. Toys, pills, gels, lubricants filled every shelf. There was even an area dedicated to taking a photograph of the porn star. Because, you know, who wouldn't want to take a photo like that on their Facebook? It was basically exactly the way I expected it to be. And look, do anyone enjoys those particular activities? You do you. I'm not trying to make fun. And since no one is allowed to have opinions about anything in this day and age without someone being outraged, all I'm trying to say is that it wasn't my cup of tea. Hal was like a kid in a candy shop though, and he began skipping around the vast aisles and I followed him for a bit, minding every step. At one point, he let out a high-pitched squeal, as if imitating a squeezed piglet. He then waddled quickly away, and excitedly joined a group of guys standing around a petite, brunette-haired girl in a lime-green bikini. I sighed and decided to hang back, still very much remorseful for my life decisions. Hello there, sir. A chipper voice called behind me. To my dismay, it was clear the question was directed at me. I turned and saw a man leaning casually over a booth counter, how you doing? The man asked, his teeth frozen in a predatory, lone shark smile that gelled perfectly with his checkered business suit. His hair was gelled back, and eyebrows trimmed to be perfectly symmetrical. He looked like the type of guy who would haggle on the ransom for his mother's life. The words, lovers of the future, were embroidered on the banner above him, but behind the desk was the real curiosity. Three female figures stood directly behind him. Spotlights shone down upon them, displaying every inch of their curvaceous frames. I thought they were booth girls, but their complete lack of movement told me otherwise. The left one was Caucasian, a redhead with green eyes dressed in pink lingerie. The middle was African American, rich auburn hair and eyes wearing white lingerie. And the one on the right was Asian, with cobalt hair, green eyes, and black lingerie. Their physical appearance were basically of angels, devoid of any skin imperfection or scar of any kind. Their figures were full and plump in the right areas. It was as if God himself had carefully handcrafted each of them to be absolutely gorgeous beyond anything naturally attainable. 
Sex dolls? I asked, pointing at the three ladies. The salesman gritted his teeth. We actually prefer the term artificial lovers. Allows them more agency. But you got the basic idea. They are sensual companions, programmed to fulfill your every desire. His grin seemed to widen as he spoke. He then shot his hand out towards me. My name's Chuck, my friend. I met his hand and shook. Carl, I replied. Nice to meet you, Kyle. Care to take a closer look? I knew I shouldn't, but with how busy gallivanting around masturbation land, I decided I had nothing better to do. Chuck guided me past the booth and back into the small tent. There, I saw the girls close up and noticed the staggering amount of detail on them, from the minuscule pores of their eyelashes to the almost artistic application of their makeup. I know they obviously wanted to make them look presentable, but I didn't expect that level of detail. They didn't even look like dolls, and if you would have stopped me on the street and told me they were, I never would have believed it. This is Erica, Benissa, and Midori, Chuck said, pointing left to right. Wow, I replied. Chuck bore an expression like he enjoyed huffing his own farts. Not bad, hmm? Wanna touch? He gestured me closer, and I stared into the eyes of Erica, the red-headed doll. I put my hand up to her cheek and gently caressed it. It was amazing. Not rubbery or artificial at all. It felt exactly like real skin. Damn, I had no idea they... I paused and began running my hand gently through her crimson locks. The smell of sweet lilac gently wafted off from her. It was honestly so damn weird seeing something that looked so human, yet it wasn't. Her emerald green eyes then suddenly darted to me. Hello, Kevin. I lurched back and nearly messed myself as she suddenly spoke. Chuck erupted into a raspy smoker laugh. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. He continued laughing as I recomposed myself. It's Carl, I clarified. Chuck didn't even acknowledge it as he held up a small remote. You can put in your preferences with this. Just a little prank I like to pull on people. Carl waltzed over and proudly slapped the agent doll on the ass. So what do you think, Keith? He asked, putting his hands on his hips. I glanced at the three dolls and shrugged. Carl, I clarified once again. I didn't know they were so realistic nowadays. Chuck nodded, displaying that smile I had quickly begun to detest. You seem like a good guy, Carl. I want to offer you something. He waved me close, putting a hand on my shoulder, as if trying to seem less douchey. How would you like to take one of them home? I eyed him skeptically knowing he was about to lay some bullcrap upon me. Chuck was prepared though. Now, before you say anything, this is a limited time offer and there is no cost involved whatsoever. His arms spread like a referee after a missed field goal. You see, Carl, I represent a brand new enterprise. We are just starting out and are currently looking to give away a few lovers free of charge. A trial run before we fully launch our product line. So, what do you say? Wanna try her out? I looked back at the dolls, still doubtful of the offer. And, I asked. And, that's it. You do what you want and report your experience back to us. Chuck handed me a black business card Lovers of the Future was written again, accompanied with the personal information of one Chuck Hagerman. For the first time, I honestly considered it. Obviously, the prospect of the whole thing was a bit... uncomfortable. I just never would have pictured myself... well, 
doing that. She was a machine, and the whole idea was just really strange. You're just giving them away? I asked, still skeptical. Chuck nodded excitedly. Limited time offer, he proudly emphasized. The old adage of things being too good to be true arose in my mind. I knew there was something he was failing to mention, but an offer like that didn't come up every day. I also did always have a bit of a thing for redheads. Chuck gave me a rundown on how they worked. He showed me the remote he had used to previously scare the hell out of me and explained that was the master control. You could input preferences, set personality features and other various functions. Chuck said they could walk, talk and perform uh, various maneuvers. Without a doubt, it was one of the most awkward conversations of my life. No matter how many times I winced, Chuck refused to stop using words like vulva, coitus, and prostate stimulation-induced climax, as if coating them with technical jargon made them any less cringeworthy. In the end, I agreed mostly so that he would just stop talking. Obviously, I didn't want Hal to know anything about it, but luckily, Chuck had a solution for that. He told me that the dolls he had with him were only floor models. He said my doll would be delivered personally and inconspicuously to my home residence. I was thankful for that, and after a few more minutes of random questions and filling out paperwork, I thanked him and left. Despite having not lost a single dollar on the transaction, I still felt as though I had been swindled as I walked away. I looked back and noticed that no one seemed to be going near that particular booth. I thought that was strange. I rendezvoused with Hal soon after and found him lugging around a generous sized bag of goodies. Hey dude, find anything? Hal asked with a smile as I approached him. I scoffed and shook my head. Oh, that's too bad. Here, check this out. He went to withdraw an item from his bag until my rapidly flailing hands made him pause. He then chuckled and continued anyways, revealing a bag of some multicolored candies. The word bag of dicks was embroidered upon the front. Gonna give them to my boss, Hal proclaimed with a chuckle. I hope you don't want to work there anymore. Hal and I continued browsing for longer than I would have liked, but eventually we wrapped it up and left. The next day I got up and began the work week same as any other, while the memory of my impromptu decision slipped back in my mind. On Wednesday of that week, I got an email from Chuck Hagerman telling me that my delivery was due that day. Apparently, Chuck's idea of inconspicuous delivery was leaving a blank six foot tall box on my doorstep. The thing weighed a ton, but after some struggle, I managed to cram it inside. Luckily for me, I live alone in a townhouse, so I didn't have any pesky roommates to hide my new accessory from. I got some scissors and began slicing the box open. It took some effort, but soon after, the outer shell of the package peeled away. That's when I saw her. A red-headed, green-eyed girl, wrapped neatly in a protective case. Seeing a human in a box like that was the weirdest thing I could have ever imagined. I mean, yeah, I know she's technically an android, but she looked so authentic. I freed her from the plastic prison and proceeded to get things set up. I found the remote that Chuck had shown me beforehand. I spent some time configuring it and consulting the instruction booklet that accompanied the package. The entire thing was apparently operated by two large batteries that were about the size of my fist. They were rechargeable and fit in a panel on a lower back. About three hours of trial and error, I was finally able to get her up and running. Hello, Carl. She spoke softly as she activated. Her green eyes blinked and lips curled into a cutesy smile. I stared, 
both unnerved and enamored by the sight of her. Uh, hi, Erica. She looked at me expectantly, with green eyes seeming to shimmer. How are you? I asked, caught a bit off guard. I am good now that I am with you. Her nose crinkled as she spoke. The skin around her eyes shifted ever so slightly. The minuscule dimples formed on her cheeks as she smiled. Once again, the sheer amount of minute detail and finesse that had gone into crafting her was astounding. She and I exchanged some basic conversations so that I could establish a baseline for what I was dealing with. What's your favorite color? Green. How old are you? 24. What's your favorite animal? Bunnies. What color is my underwear? She didn't know that one. I just sat there and talked with her for a while, my amazement growing with every response she gave. I soon realized that she could adapt to conversation. She remembered details about things I told her, and on one occasion, she even made a joke about the ugly pattern of my couch's fabric. It was incredible. And true. Chuck had emphasized how advanced she was, but she surpassed even what I had imagined. It was like she had a distinct personality of her own. Eventually, the hour grew late, and I escorted Erica down the hall and into my bedroom. Her movements were slow and a bit awkward, but that was really the only thing keeping her from appearing almost entirely human. We got into my room, and Erica stood, prudent, at the foot of the bed. Her verdant eyes curiously fixated upon me. I decided then would be a good time to, well, test out the more advanced features in her programming. Erica seemed to already know what was happening. She unzipped her grey tracksuit and let it fall to her feet. She stood there wearing only a pink bra and matching panties. I don't think I really need to go into detail about what happened next, but just know that, yes, it was what you're thinking, and yes, it definitely lasted longer than two minutes. Like I said, this was awkward for all of us. So let's just say that she performed her duties adequately and with great enthusiasm and leave it at that. For the next few days, I continued to spend time with Erica. At night, I powdered her down and stored her in the closet in my spare bedroom. The rest of that week went by without a hitch, but on Saturday, I began to notice something peculiar. It started with the smell. It was a pungent, almost mildew-like scent that seemed to hang in the air. It didn't take me long to realize it was coming from Erica. Chuck had never mentioned anything about extraneous sanitation procedures and the instructions booklet didn't either. I read through the instructions again and tried to determine where the odor was coming from. I learned a bit more about her operating system in the process and found that there were two regulators responsible for venting her internal mechanics located just behind her ears. I thought maybe one of them had become dysfunctional and caused the unpleasant scent to linger. I peeled back her hair and soon after the panel on the back of her head. There, I found the two aforementioned regulators with one of them being visibly damaged. I don't know how that happened exactly, but a certain dent in the headboard of my bed has me suspicious. The business card that Chuck had given me was still in my wallet, so I took it out and shot him an email. I then reactivated Erica. Her eyes flickered as she awoke. Good morning, Carl, she said with a smile. It was already 3pm by that point, but damn it, she was too cute for me to correct. Hi, Erica. Um... I paused and wondered how the hell I was supposed to phrase my question. Are you feeling okay? Erica nodded. I feel good, she replied. Silence then befell for a moment 
and a slight grimace formed on her face. Is something wrong? she asked. The question threw me off a bit, as I was under the impression she could only reply from direct words. It seemed like she had read my expression or body language. Regardless, I didn't have the heart to say it. No, no, everything is fine. I just wanted to make sure you liked it here. Erica's smile quickly returned and she nodded once more. The smell had really begun to get rancid. I talked with Erica a bit more before deciding to power her down for the night. For some reason, I couldn't locate her remote. I thought that was a bit weird, but being tired, I didn't really think much of it. I then returned to my room and got into bed. The next thing I know, I woke up randomly in the middle of the night. Or at least, I thought it was random. It was still dark out, and so I rolled over to go back to sleep. That's when I saw the face in my bed staring back at me. I was tired, and I don't remember exactly how I reacted. All I remember is loud shrieking, flailing, and then falling on my back hard. I crab walked away and flung the light switch up. A light brighter than a thousand suns seared into my eyeballs. After a moment of adjusting, I saw Erica in my bed, looking quite concerned. Jesus Christ, Erica, you nearly gave me a heart attack. I laughed to myself feeling as though an anaconda had released its stranglehold on my body. The surge of adrenaline caused my hands to shake wildly and I took a deep breath to calm myself down. I'm sorry, I was not properly put into sleep mode, she meekly replied. She sat at the edge of the bed and stared down. It almost seemed like she was genuinely remorseful for scaring the hell out of me. How can an android feel remorse? I reassured her that I wasn't upset and escorted her back to the other room. I also made sure to clearly emphasize that she was never to enter my room without permission, especially in the middle of the night. I powered her down in the guest bed and returned to my room. There were still so many questions on my mind about her, and every day... I seemed to be astounded by her capabilities. Chuck really undersold her capabilities. In fact, I wasn't even sure how exactly she got reactivated that night. I was almost positive I had powered her down. The next day, I went to work as usual. When I returned home, I found that the smell had gotten even worse. I still had no reply from Chuck over email. His lack of responses really began to annoy me. I still couldn't find the damn remote either. I decided to just leave Erica be until I heard back from Chuck. That night, as I was several hours into battling my insomnia, I heard something outside my room. Creak, creak, creak. It sounded like someone walking down the hallway towards Erica's room. My house is a bit older. Hardwood floors everywhere that creak in certain spots. My immediate thought was Erica. But I was absolutely sure I'd shut her down earlier. It had to be someone else. Creak. 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 The footsteps then shuffled down past my room. My heart had lodged itself firmly in my throat by that point, and I thought someone had broken in. Carefully, I reached under my bed and grabbed my baseball bat. The footsteps outside had since gone silent. Unfortunately for my dumbass, I had left my phone charging in the living room so I had no ability to call the police. Minor shuffling sounds continued out in the living room, 
and I knew I had to go and see. I clutched the bat tight, and as carefully as possible, I pushed my bedroom door open. I glanced down the hallway in both directions, and then I saw her. Erica was knelt down by the living room table, shuffling through papers upon the floor. Erica? She froze immediately, but did not turn back. I saw only her silhouette, contrasted by the moonlight shining in the windows. Erica? What are you doing? I asked. Slowly, her head turned back towards me, still hidden in shadow. She then rose slowly to her feet. My heart began to thunder in my chest, and suddenly, my companion seemed incredibly ominous, standing motionless in the dark. I flicked on the light and saw her standing there, looking completely normal. She sported her typical smile and wide, doe eyes, as if nothing was wrong. At her feet were a cluster of papers and documents, but I couldn't make out what they exactly were. Then, in her right hand, I saw she was holding her own remote. I'm sorry, Carl, Erica spoke, and my blood froze in my veins. I then realized the terrible mistake I'd made. The footsteps in the hallway crept up behind me. Something hard slammed into the back of my head before I even had the chance to turn. Everything faded to black after that. I woke up, freezing. My arms shivered and teeth chattered uncontrollably as I groggily looked around. I was in my bathtub, with chunks of ice surrounding me. A searing pain shot through my right abdomen as I awkwardly clambered out onto the floor. I fell hard as my wobbling legs proved unable to maintain balance on the slippery floor. My entire body was pale as a sheet. Lavender rings had formed under my eyes and my lips were blue as seawater. That wasn't even the worst of it. On the right side of my abdomen, just below my ribs, was a large scar. It appeared haphazardly stitched together, as if someone had been forced to do it quickly. Somehow, I managed to drag myself out into the living room where I found my phone. I dialed 911 and lost consciousness once more soon after. The last thing I saw was Erica standing in the corner, looking at me. I'm guessing that was the first time the cops responded to a call from a naked guy fresh out of an ice bath with a love doll stationed beside. Because the looks they gave me later on were absolutely priceless. It was later discovered by hospital staff that I was in the early stages of hypothermia, and if I had been in that tub another 20 minutes, I may not have been able to tell this story. They also discovered that I was missing both my right kidney and a large chunk of my liver. I guess that explains the stitches. The cops were of course quite curious about my housemate, but I didn't even know what to tell them. Apparently, Erica was at my side when the cops arrived. She had covered me with a blanket and was trying to warm me up as the cops rolled up. They took me to the hospital and took her into custody. It was only after trying to obtain her fingerprints and realizing that she didn't have any that they discovered what she actually was. That must have been a really strange moment for them. They interrogated me for a long damn time after that. It wasn't me they were really after though. It was Erica. But more specifically, her creator. Erica was not a polyurethane android as I had been led to believe. Her design was a whole lot more sophisticated and disturbing than that. Her ligaments, tendons 
and major organs were replaced by a series of artificial ones. A mechanical skeleton was interlaced with a complex series of preservative equipment, but her skin, eyes, brain, teeth and skull were confirmed to be authentic and not artificial. Parts of her originated from an actual human woman. They used a lot more technical terms, but I didn't understand a whole lot. They weren't able to get any DNA samples, but Erica herself bears a striking resemblance to a missing girl from Minnesota. The smell from earlier turned out to be a result from her skin beginning to rot after the failure of the preservation components. The cops suspect me of doing these horrible augmentations to her. I only had one name to counter them. Chuck Hagerman. They clearly don't believe my story, and I don't even blame them. They checked the records of that stupid expo, and big surprise, there was no record of anyone named Chuck Hagerman ever being there. Even the email address he gave me just displays an error message when I tried to contact it. The papers that Erica was digging through that night turned out to be my banking information, social security, birth certificate, W-2s, and other personal things. A lot of my financial accounts have been compromised, which I'm sure I also have Chuck to thank for. Apparently, a human kidney is worth about $65,000 on the black market. I don't know why it is that whoever took it didn't take more honestly. Maybe Erica stopped them. Maybe they just ran out of time while they were harvesting. But I suspect it's something more than that. The x-ray also uncovered a microchip implanted in the skin between my thumb and index finger. I don't even know what to do at this point. I had no idea technology like this even existed, let alone would be used for such nefarious purposes. I just feel so bad for Erica more than anything. I don't know what will happen to her now, but it's clear she can never be the girl she once was. In conclusion, I would just like to say, screw you, Chuck Hagerman, you sick asshole. I know that's not your real name, and I know you know that I know what you're up to. I may be confined to a hospital bed for now, but you can't hide forever. I want my kidney back, and if it takes me the rest of my life, I will find you. Erica told me some interesting things. Things that are about to make life very difficult for you. Most of us feel quite safe when the weather turns bad. We have houses, castles of steel, plaster and wood. We have television and the internet systems to warn us about anything actually dangerous. Modern life serves every need. Aside from natural disasters, weather rarely poses a problem in the 21st century. Gone are the days of muddy caves, of huts and villages. Now we live in monuments to our achievement. And so, when rain comes down in sheets, when cracks of light split the air open and reverberating rumbles follow, we feel nothing but excitement. But sometimes, the atmosphere beyond our walls is violent enough to unnerve us. The wind is powerful enough to make our houses creak, and the tap of the rain turns into roars. Then, thunder erupts just outside, impossibly loud. The ground shakes, and for a moment, a primal urge to hide takes over. Our instincts are buried deep, but the untamed might of a storm can dredge them up. Because at the core, we're still frightened animals. We just upgraded our caves. It was on a thunderous night that I spoke to the Soul Eater. I'd finished my evening rituals and crawled under the sheets. The noise of the rain comforted me at first, 
a soothing static lull. But when the storm intensified, my breath grew shallow with anxiety. I've never bothered with psychiatric help, so I don't know what diagnosis they'd give my brain. But whatever plagues me, it's twisted my thoughts since childhood. I thought about my mind a lot that night, laying in my bed as the window flashed with lightning. Why am I the way that I am? What does it mean to be me? Is it even worth it to be me? These questions swirled in my head as the storm raged outside. I found no answers. The interesting thing was that most people would actually want to be me, or at least to live my lifestyle. I'd found success in writing thriller novels and my possessions were impressive. My house was grand and stately, situated in the woodland corner of a nice neighborhood. Yet, it was empty. Nobody to share my home with. I was also empty myself. I had nobody with which to share my true self. I was hyper-conscious of the fact that I'd missed out on young love. That beautiful, blissful experience. Thirty years old and alone? Sure, I could find someone, but the damage of loneliness had already been done. And, since I wasn't living for somebody else, what was I really living for? I'd never particularly enjoyed life. When I was a teenager, I lived because I had a future. When I was in my early twenties, I lived to take care of my mother. When I was in my late twenties, I lived because I had stories to tell. Now that future was here. My mother was gone, and my stories were told. What was left? Years of rotting in this mansion? Of trying to recover the feeling of the youth I wasted? It would never return. Not much of a point in continuing. Krakow! The thunder rang out like a thousand simultaneous gunshots. My house, my enormous empty house, shuddered shaking dust from the ceiling. Instinctively, I pulled the blankets over my head before a sense of shame for my childish reaction took over and forced the covers back down. I realized I needed to sleep. My thoughts were taking a dark turn. My emotions were bubbling to the surface, dredged up by the storm. I tried to lie still and shut off my thoughts. Seconds turned to minutes, then to hours. I was preparing myself to go grab some Ambium when another crack of thunder exploded over the house. As the rumble faded, I heard something else. A dull thud from downstairs. The front door had been slammed shut. I remembered locking it that night. I lay quietly, pondering. A robbery? Should I call the cops or pretend to be asleep? What if it wasn't a robbery at all? Perhaps some poor soul caught in the storm had sought shelter. Nicholas, called a deep voice from outside my room. My heart froze. Goosebumps broke out across my entire body. Whoever was out there, they sounded like no human I'd ever met before. I tried to sit up. Nothing happened. I couldn't move. It was like I was held in place by an invisible weight. Sleep paralysis. It happened to me from time to time. The phenomenon always carried a heavy burden of fear due to a concoction of hallucinations. But this time, I found it somewhat reassuring. It meant the voice outside my door wasn't real. I held my breath as the doorknob turned, slowly, agonizingly. My bedroom door creaked as it swung open and a figure came into view. The man was floating, horizontally, as if he lay face down on thin air. As he drifted across the room and over my bed, I had a sickening realization. It was me. 
my body, my face, even the pajamas that I had at that very moment. He became motionless as he hovered directly above me. For a moment, we just stared at each other. Then his mouth moved, and the voice that emerged was so alien, I couldn't imagine it sinking with a person's lips, much less my own. Hello, Nicholas. Deep, knowing, mournful, as if the ocean could speak. And above that, a barely perceptible static buzz in the words. I only stared. Come on now, be polite, chided the ghost. I found I could speak. You're not real, I told him. At this, my face, suspended just a few feet above me, only smiled. I was thinking we could have a conversation tonight. The hallucination's voice boomed around the room, echoing from more distant corners of the house. About what? I asked him. I tried to move my arms and legs, but they refused to respond. It would be a long night. Life, death, you. I answered with a stare, at which the facsimile of me broke into an ever larger grin. Let's start with a question. Why are you alive? Of course, he knew my thoughts. This was, after all, my dream. Still, a weird feeling crept through my paralyzed body when he mentioned the exact same question I just asked myself. Because my life has value, I answered. Hardly a satisfactory answer, Nicholas. Why does your life have value? The ghost said in that unearthly voice. I hesitated for a few moments. There are good things in my life. I eat well. I relax. I want for nothing. Good? The floating version of me chuckled. Eating well is good? Relaxing is good? What about the bad, Nicholas? It doesn't matter how satisfied your material urges are if your soul is diseased. I didn't answer. The fear that had dissipated minutes ago returned at the words. This didn't feel like a normal dream. Ponder this. How does the good in your life compare to the bad? The negatives are overwhelming. You have more regret than pride. You have more anger than joy. You have more aches and pains than comfortable moments. And your loneliness outweighs your love with the gravity of a world. Shut up, I told the thing and shut my eyes. Again, I tried to move. And again, my body failed me. No, the word resounded, sonorous and static, from inches above my face. I opened my eyes and found the ghost had moved much closer. The smile had left his face. Every moment is a battle between joy and pain, and which one wins the majority of the time. There's no formula I can contrive to prove this to you, but you know the truth, deep within you. You see, Nicholas, here's the truly sad aspect of all this. You live a better life than the majority of all humans that have ever lived, and you're still unhappy. What does that tell you about life? Life is suffering, I conceded. It was a mantra some of my characters liked to repeat. He smiled again, suspended over me, and floated upwards a few inches. I hated my own face at that moment, a taunting and smug grin. 
So, why live? His question came out as a whisper that held more menace than any of the previous booming statements. I stared up at the being. Faith, I answered after a minute. His laugh was loud and rolling, like a series of crashing waves. Faith? He repeated. Faith in what? Life is made of uncertainty. What if there's someone up there? Someone up there? You pitiful thing. You must know there's nobody. Nothing. And if, by some great accident, there was a being that created you, would you not curse it for your flaws? For the suffering inherited in what you are? The God which created you would be nothing short of evil. I can't explain it. I don't have to. That's what faith is. A passion for something greater than yourself. But, as I said the words, I knew I didn't believe them. I'd never been religious. Liar, taunted the ghost as he pointed an arm down at me. And, even if you weren't attempting to deceive yourself, think of the very notion of the grand scheme of things. Some kind of cosmic plan. Is it truly a comforting idea that you are merely a cog in the machine created by an incomprehensible force? A cold feeling spread through me at that, but I forced myself to ignore it. I kept forgetting it was still a dream only a manifestation of my subconscious. I couldn't let it disturb me, but there was something about the way the ghost moved and spoke that just wasn't right. It was like no sleep paralysis episode I'd ever suffered. Nicholas. Why live? Asked the hallucination once more. Because... The future... I answered. He smiled and opened his mouth, but I cut him off. And no, not because I think I'm destined to be successful, like I used to think. I mean because I can wake up tomorrow and go to Europe, because I can choose to do anything I want. Maybe I am unhappy, maybe there's really nothing divine out there, but I have the freedom to choose my life. I felt determined to beat this thing. As I understood it, the dream would end when I proved him wrong, showing that my life was worth living. He stared down at me, not visibly angry, but when he spoke, that static buzz in his voice was more noticeable. Wrong. For the first time, I noticed his eyes. They were not exactly like mine. Some kind of yellow tint pervaded them. Wrong, he said again. You aren't free, you worm. You're a puppet, a biological object used to perpetuate your species. You say you can go to Europe tomorrow, but you won't. You only do what your urges tell you to do. You are the sum total of the forces that evolution built inside of you. That raised even more defiance in me. You know what? That doesn't matter. I feel free, and so I am. Fundamentally, there's no difference in my reality either way. But Nicholas, even if you feel free, is there not a negative experience? Is there not horror in being forced into this world without meaning? A wanderer condemned to seek something he can never find. As long as you hold this delusion close to your heart, that you are free, you will never be satisfied, because you must surely believe there is some combination of choices out there that will save you from what you are. The cold feeling returned, and I recognized it for what it was. The realization that the ghost was right. For all the malice and hopelessness that poured out from his grinning mouth, his refutations made sense. The ghost 
didn't stop. That's the bane of it all, really. Consciousness. That awareness. That sickening knowledge that you exist. Human beings. They don't really want to be beings. They just want to be. But yourself cannot simply be. For it strives constantly. Yourself, Nicholas, strives to disintegrate. Look behind the veil of the most enjoyable activities in this life and realize that they are a process of becoming unself. Sex, drugs, love, even fun itself. Happiness is the process of killing self-awareness. I squeezed my eyes shut and tried to move, hoping that the nightmare would end. When I opened them again, the ghost lay on top of me. I could see nothing but his eyes. So much like mine, but with a strange yellow light behind them. What do you want? I asked him. Your soul. I thought I was just a biological creature without a soul. Then, it should be nothing to relinquish. What do you want me to do? I whispered. Give up, he whispered back, and static filled the room. The ghost floated higher, nearly disappearing into the murky gloom of my high arched ceiling. Then he began to change, and the facade of me, the facade of humanity, fell away like a withered leaf, and I saw how vast the thing truly was. It hung in the air like smoke and filled the mind in a way that pushed out all ability to describe it. When I regained my words, I asked, What are you? The Soul Eater, it said, a dry buzzing in its words. I did not respond. Nicholas, it's time, the demon told me. Give in. Let me have it. The thing was right. It was right about me. It was right about this world. It was right about life. No, I spat the word. Something in me wanted to live. The demon above shifted and writhed. Why? Because what is life for, if not continuation? There's a force inside me, and I want to preserve it. I don't care how bad things are. The soul eater hissed. It grew until there was nothing else, and then it tried to strip my soul. There's nothing much I can say that will accurately describe what I felt in that moment. It should suffice to say that I am scarred, and I will never forget it. But I won. I fought off those grasping threads of spirit. Life won. Eventually, the Soul Eater withdrew. You and I will do this again. A lump of dread manifested in me. What if the being came when I was weak? Then I realized I just fought it off at my weakest moment. And some sort of pride filled me. And I will win again, I told it. You've won millions of times already, but on one of these repetitions, you will fail. You see, Nicholas, the universe repeats itself. It expands, it contracts, it re-expands. And every time, the same things happen, almost. There are two things that change. The first is myself. I've been present for every rise and fall, from the dawn of time and before. I exist in another place, in another way. The universe does not control me, and so I last, through the endless back and forth, living through realities as you live through minutes. The second, Nicholas, is that the universe is dying. Every expansion, every contraction, it grows weaker, fainter. And you, right now, are an uncountable number of expansions from the beginning. One of these days, you will have faded enough to give in. 
There is a secret, only I know Nicholas. What? I asked, terrified to hear the answer. Everything already ended. The thing hissed in a hoarse whisper. It's over. The universe once existed in glory, but it's dead now. You're just the fading ripples, a pale echo of what once was. And with that, the soul eater moved back through my door, out of my house, and into the night. As soon as it left, I found I could move again. I held my hands to my face and cried. Just sobbed for the longest time. It had to have been the most traumatic dream of my life. But of course, it was just that. A dream, sleep paralysis, a common psychological phenomenon. That didn't explain why my door was open. It's been 10 years since my conversation with the Soul Eater. My life is different now. I found a wife that I love. I had kids. Little bundles of happiness and energy that exhaust and delight me. Gone are the days of lying alone in my bed, staring up at the ceiling, wondering what I was missing. And so, when I have negative thoughts, when I begin to wonder if this world is worth living in, the answer is lying right next to me, and in rooms across the hall. But sometimes, I see a familiar figure in the distance, outside my house, or when I'm driving the kids to school, I spot a glimpse of my doppelganger on the side of the road, floating just a few inches off the ground, and grinning. And for a moment, I remember everything. I feel everything that I felt on that night. I realize I buried the truth with a textbook lifestyle designed to be fulfilling. Because at the core, I'm still a lonely animal, fending off the truth of an uncaring world. I just upgraded my defenses. The sound of the wooden swing swayed as we exited the car. The gentle breeze helped make the humid and sunny afternoon more tolerable, but still, the air remained thick. I could feel the sweat coming from my forehead as I stared at the two-story brick home before me. This was the right place. I checked my powder blue shirt to make sure no sweat had stained it. I wanted to look professional as I shot Ducks a glance to see him looking over me with a smirk on his face. Are you ready? He asked, as he turned his head, studying the flower beds that laid in the yard. I suppose I am, because this heat is killing me. First time in the bio, eh? You should know it, because I had never been further than St. Louis until I got hooked up with you. He started to walk up the pavement and to the porch. I followed, studying the red brick home and the windows. It was a charming house, one where you could tell the owners cared for appearances. The wind carried the swing again as I turned to look at it. It was hard to believe that something so awful could have happened to a child. Do you think she's lying? Dux asked. Why would someone lie about something like demon possession? People like attention and want to feel special sometimes, or they don't want to admit that there might be mental illness. I don't think that is the case for this one. It could be another Jack from Reno for all we know. That was a waste of time. Even the Vatican knew he was full of crap and we should have followed their lead. That was different, I responded. Jack was a drunk whose wife left him for a car dealer. He thought that being possessed would bring his wife back to him. Well, she didn't come back, and it didn't end well for Jack. Ducks replied while he stood next to the front door. He was right. 
the story of Jack from Reno did not end well. I also didn't want a rehash today. She sounded pretty convinced on the phone, Docs. I walked on the stairs and knocked on the door. The two of us waited while I could hear footsteps coming from inside. After a moment, the door opened, revealing a woman. She was in her early 40s, but attractive with blonde hair. But it was her eyes that caught me. They were a deep, dark blue that appeared soft and showed a sense of warmth. Are you Henry Page? She asked curiously. I nodded. Yes, Mrs. Decker. Has anything else happened since we last spoke? Call me Lisa, please. And nothing outside of what I described since we got off the phone. Will you come in? We stepped inside the house into a foyer that was a cream colour. I noticed a picture of the crucifixion on the left wall. The glass appeared to have a small crack in it. There was something else though. It was frigid inside the home. It was much too cold for summer, even for me and where I was from. Can I offer anything to drink? Lisa asked as she walked down past the staircase and through the hall. I looked over to Ducks, who shrugged, and we began to follow her. It amazes me that Southerners will still offer a bit of sweet tea while their child's soul is being flayed, Ducks quipped. No, I'm fine, I replied, trying to ignore Ducks' comment. I noticed another chill as I walked past the stairs. I looked up to see a bedroom door closed. It had a deadbolt attached to it, and it was locked tightly. Ducks looked upstairs too, and had a puzzled look on his face. He could sense it as well. That would be the location of our demon. Come, take a seat, Mr. Page, Lisa said, as the two of us walked inside what I assumed to be the living room. The room was nice. It had white chairs and a couch, along with a coffee table sitting in the center. The bright summer afternoon poured the sunlight through the two oversized windows behind the couch. I saw Lisa sitting next to a man. I assumed it was the father of the child. He was a plain looking fellow, with black hair and olive skin. He looked of a defeated man. His shoulders slouched and a face that carried exhaustion. He had hazel eyes from what I could tell, but he did not look over to me. He just gazed to the floor below. I took a seat across from them, while Ducks stood closely behind me. When did your daughter start acting strange? Her name is Annabelle, the man mumbled. I apologize, Mr. Decker, but when did Annabelle begin acting strange? I asked again. It started a month ago, after she came back from a vacation with a friend's family, Lisa answered. She seemed quiet at first, and seemed to have lost interest in her usual activities. What kind of activities did Annabelle do? She mostly did soccer, and spent time with a youth group. A religious youth group? I asked. Lisa nodded. Yes, they get together several times a week and study the Bible. Would you say she's very religious? I asked as I looked over to her father. He seemed to be part distraught and annoyed by my questioning. I watched as he clenched his fist and lifted his head with tears in his eyes. I was right. His eyes were hazel. She is very devout, Mr. Page, he snapped. That's why it latched onto her, Ducks chimed in. A young girl dedicated to Jesus like a well-marbled stake to a demon. A loud thud echoed through the room. It started to become colder, and a sound thundered from upstairs. 
the demon knew of our presence now. Where did she visit? I asked. She visited New Orleans, he replied. I knew she should have never went to such a godless place. Michael, please, this is not our fault, Lisa responded. I leaned back in my chair and watched as the father began to sob. Ducks was quiet, thankfully. The sound of scratching began to come from upstairs. It was frantic and aggressive. The demon was trying to spook us. But this was not the first time I had to deal with a demon, nor would it be my last. Has anyone seen her since this started happening? I asked. We asked our pastor to come pray for her, Lisa replied. It was then we knew something was wrong. What happened? Annabelle said something that shocked us all. The two parents looked at each other. Lisa looked nervous, as if she was ashamed of what her daughter had said. She was taking it better than her husband, who had started to weep uncontrollably. I smiled gently at her. I did not care what the daughter had said, and I wanted them to know I was not judging them. What did your daughter say? She told them that she screwed his dead wife and that one day she would screw him too. Ducks let out a chuckle as I kept my eyes locked at the parents of Annabelle. I did not even want to acknowledge that he had found humour. I stood up from my chair and looked at the ceiling to hear the scratching from upstairs. Take me to see your daughter, I said, as Doug smiled. He had become bored with all the talk. We were here for a reason, and that was to free the girl of the demon. We should consult with our pastor first, Michael said. You could, or you could save yourself some time while he stands idly by out of his element and tries to form a prayer circle. Your best bet is me and I can have your daughter back before dinner. Doc smiled. It's about time you said something. I was getting bored with the sob stories. Lisa nodded and stood up from the couch. The three of us walked back to the staircase. She looked at Annabelle's door nervously as she began to climb the stairs. We slowly crept up outside the room. Lisa's hand shook as she tried to unlock the deadbolt and gently opened the door. It was dark inside, but I could hear a faint giggle. It was wise for her to deadbolt the girl inside, Doug said dryly. They could have woken up with their precious little daughter shoving a kitchen knife into their chests. Sweetie, I've brought someone to see you, and he says he can help you. Lisa called out to a young teenager sitting on the floor. She looked much like her mother with similar hair and eyes. She wore dark pants and a white shirt that was stained. She smelled of urine and feces. No one could help me, especially not this cocksucker, she replied as she showed us her bloodstained teeth. She had been biting herself and leaving teeth marks in her arms. I noticed a necklace on her, with a small crystal on it. Where did she get that necklace, Lisa? I asked. She brought that home from a New Orleans trip. Did she say where she got it from? She said it was just some small shop in the French Quarter. She probably went into one of those New Age stores, and the moron inside didn't know they had a tethering crystal. Ducks chimed in. Probably sold it to the girl for ten bucks. That would be the source, I said as I looked to Lisa. The little stone on her neck is the invitation, and that's why the demon came to her. A witch saw my baby an evil necklace? Lisa asked with a look of confusion. I doubt they even knew what they had, I replied as Annabelle smiled again. I looked in front of her and studied her for a minute. Lisa, will you please leave us be? 
I promise you, this will not take long. She looked concerned. I will pray for you all. Your God doesn't care about your little daughter. Annabelle laughed. I heard the door close. The three of us stood silently for the moment. The room was freezing, and it suddenly felt darker. Annabelle looked over ducks and studied him. She gave him a sinister smile and turned back to me. I know him, she snarled. I suppose you know what is next then, ducks responded. I placed my hand around the young girl's throat. She began to cough as her eyes started to turn black. I always hated this part as a dark substance began to drip from her mouth. She began to convulse and tremble as the demon began to exit her body. I watched as the last of the liquid left her mouth and began to drip onto my wrist. The spirit began to climb up to my upper arm and shoulder as I opened my mouth. It was always a bitter taste, but I had done this enough that I didn't gag anymore. I felt my body ache and my head began to pound. It always felt like I was getting hit by a truck for the first five minutes, but this one felt worse. It was more intense than the others I had absorbed. This one is wild, isn't it? Ducks grinned. Shut up, Ducks! I looked down to notice that Annabelle was looking from the ground at me. She looked scared. I knelt down and smiled at her. I'm not here to hurt you. Your mom asked me to help you. And now I'll be leaving. Where are my parents? I'll get them for you. Just hold on a minute. I said as I walked over to the door. Not even gonna let the girl know you saved her from a demon, Henry? Ducks asked. Please, Ducks, shut up! I snapped. Who are you talking to, mister? Annabelle asked as I turned around to see Ducks standing behind her. His eyes a dark charcoal colour and his teeth brown and rotting, smiling at her. I am good at hiding the fact that I am possessed myself. But today, my partner has been a bit more annoying than usual. I know one, Annabelle, I said calmly, as I watched Ducks walk over to me. He smiled his awful grin again and waited for me to open the door. It was time for us to move on to find the next demon. We had several more to go before the Legion was reunited. I picked up the habit from watching my father. He was a relentless three-pack-a-day smoker, going through the sticks like they could save his life rather than take it. I and my siblings grew up surrounded by yellow-stained walls. I'd watch him sit in front of the TV and pull the embers ever so closer to his sickly teeth. If a real fire had even occurred in our home, we wouldn't know it until the flames were set upon us. The fire alarm hung uselessly, stripped of its batteries. You'd think, growing up, watching my father slowly killing himself would be enough to keep me away from taking a single drag. But, I foolishly idolized the man. When I was 15 and he was fast asleep, I snuck into his room and pried a single cigarette from the box on his bedside table. The first time I inhaled the smoke, I could feel my body rebelling. A stuttering cough accompanied by exhaled smoke and spit. My dad always smoked like they were feeding the purest of air into his lungs and I thought it was so cool. So I continued sneaking smokes, as many as I could without him noticing. I'd sit out on the balcony and cast the small light against the darkness with my flickering, half dead lighter. Eventually, I got the hang of it. 
and went to show my dad how smoothly I could work the smoke through my teeth like an angry dragon. He was furious. Even though they had nothing to do with it, my siblings and I received a lashing and lectures about the dangers of smoking. When my oldest brother shot back and told her father that he should quit smoking too, my father replied that it was already too late for that to matter. And he was right. Just a few years later, lung cancer ate its way through my father, creeping along, destroying him from the inside out like he had done to our house for so many years. We watched him become thin, his skin grew so pale until he almost matched the sticks he was so fond of. To the very end, he would continue to smoke those three packs, never a man to know when to quit. One of the final conversations I had with my father was mere hours before his passing. His voice sounded like a wisp, faint and distant. With a shaking hand, he motioned for one more cigarette, and I obliged, pulling one loose from the pack for myself as well. We both took a deep inhale, sitting together in the house, my siblings long since fled from. I'm sorry. His voice was made up of final gestures. I looked curiously towards him as he explained his regrets for the life he forced us to live and the environment he created. That our walls, the ones that were supposed to keep us safe, should have been pearly white. We deserve that, he said. He also, with what little energy he had left, offered me one final warning, that I would end up just like him if I continued to keep smoking like I was. Then, within a few hours, he was gone. The arrangements and proceedings that take place are very stressful, especially for an 18 year old still figuring life out. Contrary to my father's wishes, I only find my trips to the balcony becoming more and more frequent. I wasn't smoking quite as much as my pops used to, but I wasn't far off either. Once all the stress brought on by his passing was said and done, my only comfort was found behind the filaments in those ivory cylinders. The days passed and I did my best to find work that was stable enough to afford the apartment that we grew up in. It was so much more roomier when I was the only one left. I got permission from the landlord to paint over the stained walls, but just never got around to it. I kept so much of the apartment the same, right down to the raggy recline he used to sit on. On the anniversary of his passing, I found myself picking up a fresh pack of smokes and heading out to the balcony. As I placed the brown to my lips, I remembered the final smoke that I had with my father. That night was much colder. On the balcony, one year after his passing, my fingers pulled down on the lighter's wheel to give birth to the gentle orange flame. I watched the cars passing by as I pulled the lighter closer and lit the cigarette. The soft embers rested on the edge, and with my breath, I instructed them to creep up towards me. As the smoke poured out from my lips, I noticed something within my peripheral. At first, I assumed somehow a passing car's light had bounced off the smoke, but I couldn't fully rationalize it to myself. I caught myself staring at where I thought I saw something another plastic chair on the other side of the balcony, a green lawn chair that was vacant in the dim illumination the moon offered. Like the machine I'd become, I continued to take another breath in, pulling the fire inside ever closer. This inhale was particularly heavy, as the date had me on edge already, and so I let out a large plume of smoke. It was unmistakable. 
through the column of smoke rising towards the dark sky. I could see something sitting on the chair across from me. When all the smoke had been expelled from my lips, the vision vanished with it. The cigarette hung unaltered in my lips as I stared intently at the empty chair, trying to process what I had seen. Leaning forward, I rose my hand up and clamped my fingers around the cigarette and pulled as much air in as I could. Embers travelled like wildfire, scorching the pristine surface, pulling veins of red towards me. Slowly and methodically, I let the smoke trickle out. A small pillar spilled, so I could keep smoke in front of me longer. Once again, through the translucent grey veil, I could see a humanoid figure sitting on the chair. My eyes narrowed, still carefully letting the smoke flow. I could see that his skin was grey, with dim veins of red covering its body. From within the smoke, I watched as the visitor turned its head towards me. Bright red sunspots made up its eyes, flaring like a fire pit. Just as we were about to lock eyes, my lungs emptied and the last of the smoke disappeared. One more, one more puff, I thought to myself, and wondered how many times my father had that very same thought. The same process repeated. I sucked in every bit of cancer I could from the cigarette and held a timid burn in my lungs, letting the smoke swirl about. Lips parted, and brief exhales brought the smoke forth, revealing the thing again. We met eyes. Despite the flames that they were formed of, the eyes held a sense of familiarity to me. I had seen these eyes many times before. Its skin cracked off, revealing more bits of red tracing embers underneath. It was made of ash and flame. Just as I began to comprehend what the being was, I coughed, letting out a ball of smoke. From within that smoke, that seemed to hang in the air and defy its own will to drift upwards, I saw the being lunge from the chair. It leapt at me with its ashen arms outstretched, a gaping maw formed under its eyes. The inside of its mouth was like a furnace that stretched on into an eternity of violent and desperate flames. I quickly brought my hand up and swatted the smoke hanging in front of me, forcing it to separate and diminish. With that, the advancing being vanished as well. Looking down, I could see that scattered around the balcony were burning bits of ash, like cigarette butts. I haven't seen the being again since that night, not in the flicker of a bonfire or of the smoke of a barbecue. Sometimes I consider walking onto the balcony and pulling another cigarette out, trying to see the being once more, but I'm sure he's served his purpose. I haven't touched the cigarette since after all. My old man made it awfully easy to quit, even if he had to do it through the same smoke that took him from me.